Welcome to the Insomnia Coach Podcast. My name is Martin Reed. I believe that nobody needs to live with chronic insomnia and that evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques can help you enjoy better sleep for the rest of your life. The content of this podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not medical advice and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any disease, disorder or medical condition. It should never replace any advice given to you by your physician or any other licensed healthcare provider. Insomnia Coach LLC offers coaching services only and does not provide therapy, counselling, medical advice or medical treatment. The statements and opinions expressed by guests are their own and are not necessarily endorsed by Insomnia Coach LLC. All content is provided as is and without warranties, either express or implied. Gretchen is a paediatrician and the mother of three children. Her sleep was regularly disrupted as she worked shifts during college and was on call during her paediatric residency. After having children and then entering early menopause, Gretchen started to spend hours awake during the night. This led to sleep-related worry and anxiety that combined with work stress to make sleep more frustrating and more difficult. In this episode, Gretchen talks about how changing the way she thinks about sleep and implementing constructive sleep-related behaviours helped her improve her sleep significantly, and how setbacks along the way didn't lead to insomnia working its way back into her life. Gretchen went from believing she was the world's worst sleeper to looking forward to going to bed at night. Gretchen did it, and you can too. A full transcript of this podcast and an accompanying video can be found at insomniacoach.com forward slash podcast. Okay, so Gretchen, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So can we start right from the beginning? And can you just tell us when your sleep issues began and in what ways were you struggling with sleep? Um, So I struggled with sleep for many, many years. Um, Things got noticeably worse probably seven years ago um, when I entered early menopause. Um, and, um, so for the past seven years, I've just been struggling more nights than not. Mm -hmm. So was it kind of, did you tend to struggle with falling asleep at the start of the night or was it more to do with waking and then finding it hard to fall back to sleep? Maybe, maybe, or maybe both. Yeah, for me, it was both. So Mm. it would take me a long time to fall asleep. Um, and then I would pop up multiple times during the night and just, stay awake, um, thinking in my brain way too hard and wishing I could go back to sleep. Mm. And so I think you kind of touched upon it there, but wh- why do you think you were struggling with sleep? You know, like, what do you think was the, the barrier that was making sleep more difficult for you? I think ultimately the issue was the anxiety that I developed around sleep. Um, so I think initially there were maybe some hormonal issues that switched in my body and Mm. then, um, issues just related to family conflict and worries about that, um, and work stress, all the normal things. But Mm. then I think why this became such a huge problem for me is that at the slightest sign of sleep trouble, my brain would just launch into this full fledged attack like this is going to be terrible oh my gosh here goes another bad night oh you've only got six hours left to get a good sleep you better fall asleep right now Mm -hmm. Um, you know and so that would just make things a hundred times worse yeah you I think you touched upon this right at the start of, of of our discussion but I think you mentioned that you tended to always feel that sleep was a little bit of a struggle for you you know more than just when it become a major issue like do you feel yeah. like upon reflection that it's always been something's been in the background for most of your life I really do and it kind of when I was reflecting on what we might talk about I think from a very young age I 
always neglected sleep or neglected to recognize sleep was important or just always treated it as something that could be put on the back burner and mm. fixed later. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of through high school and college, I would always stay up late either because of part-time jobs I had or just getting through my studies. Um, and then in medical school and training to be a pediatrician, it was required to either stay up all night working or you might be allowed to sleep at the hospital, but then um, woken up you know, several times during the night by nurses that needed help. And so that just became normal, um, kind of ex getting a poor night's sleep was normal. Mm -hmm. um, and then my first real job as a pediatrician, I worked in the emergency room and I worked all the different shifts. So I worked a day shift, I worked an evening shift that would end at midnight, and then I worked an overnight shift that would end at 7.30 in the morning. And so I don't think my body ever really knew like what is a sleep routine. Mm. Um, and then I started having kids and, and, and my kids, some of them, uh, one particular was just a terrible sleeper. So I fully expected to go to bed each night and be woken up six times during the night due yeah. to his needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, it just became normal to sleep poorly and function on poor sleep. Um, so that it just kind of smoldered along and didn't really question it. Um, but then uh, I think it just became unbelievable that it could worsen from that terrible point. Mm. It got even worse. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people will identify with that, you know, just being able to recognize that they just, not, not so much struggle, but recognize that sleep maybe is a bit more of an issue in their lives than it is for other people, but it's never really been a big deal. But then something kind of switches after a time and then it becomes like more of an issue. Yeah. And I think that the reason that is, is because, you know, some of us are just more predisposed to sleep disruption, you know, whether it's just genetic or if we have a more stressful life, we're more reactive to stress, things like that. Um, but we don't implement behaviors to try and fix that. You know, we're just really not paying attention to it. So we have some sleep disruption but we kind of get through it, you know, after a couple of days, you know, our sleep gets back on track. And then, um, so for example, if you're working shifts, it's natural for your sleep to be disrupted, but then it will typically get back on track. And people can go on like this, you know, probably indefinitely. Right. But then when it becomes a bigger issue, that's typically because we see these perpetuating factors, which is when we start to modify our behaviors with the specific intention to improve our sleep. You know, and these can include things like going to bed earlier, you know, often before we're sleepy, spending mm -hmm. more time in bed, staying in bed later, um, modifying our days, maybe even calling in sick after bad nights of sleep. And then just the way we think about sleep changes, you know, we tend to spend more time researching sleep, reading about sleep, thinking, worrying about sleep. And all of these things turn what would just be, you know, this acute sleep disruption to short term a few days here, a few days there into this more chronic issue. It makes it really hard for our sleep to get back on track. Does, does that, do you think that that might help yeah. explain that progression? Yeah. I mean, I, I, for a while I was convinced I could fix it. And so I, I would make this huge chart to try to determine why one day was better, you know, mm. okay, I went jogging this day and then how did I sleep? Okay. I had a beer with dinner. How did I sleep? Okay. I meditated. Um, and I, you know, and so I would spend all day kind of charting what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know, with the intent that that would then create a better night. But I think it just added to this mounting kind of obsession, you know, yeah. like I can just, if I just study this hard enough, I can crack this and make it better. And then that just made bedtime loaded, you know, this mm -hmm. lots of anxiety about it. Yeah, yeah def I think a lot of people listening will identify with that, you know, just that just really paying attention to everything you do during the day to evaluate if it's going to have an effect on your sleep, you know, and ultimately really all that does is it kind of just distracts you and makes sleep more difficult because yeah. besides it just kind of making you just always focus and think about sleep nonstop, um, it can give you the impression that you can somehow control sleep. You know, right. so for example, you can get this impression that if I do a, a two hour workout at 6.23 p.m. 
I yeah. know I'll sleep well that night. Right. You know? But the problem is, is then you go to bed and you're just monitoring for sleep. Okay, yeah. did this work? Did this work? Didn't it work? And let's say you do sleep well that night, you can sort of believe that it was because you took that two hour workout at 6.23 p.m. So when it doesn't work the next night, it never did work, but then when you feel it didn't work, then you even more worried because that's just another thing that in air quotes didn't work. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. It, so it was funny last night because knowing we were going to be talking today, you know, it, there's still a lot of old habits ingrained mm -hmm. in my brain. And I said to myself, oh, wouldn't it just be ironic if I couldn't sleep the night before I'm supposed to talk to Martin? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was just like, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to go into that whole what if and if it's a bad night and I was able to nip it in the bud but it was just funny I'm so used to kind of thinking too hard about it yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and I, I that's a good point you know I think it's it when you've lived with insomnia for so long your your confidence your sleep confidence is just so low you know yeah. so even yeah. when you start to implement these techniques and you see improvements and your sleep improves for for quite some time, I think it's natural that your confidence is still going to be quite fragile, you know, yeah. so if you do experience that night, that, that night of difficulty, it's easy to think, oh no, my insomnia is back, you know, I'm back to square one. When yeah. in fact, most of the time we can identify any potential cause, you know, so if there's like a doctor's appointment the next day or a deadline at work, something like that, it's natural for sleep to be disrupted. Um, it's just a key, it's just the process of just looking ahead and just, you know, just believing that these techniques that have worked for you before, they're going to work again. You just have to stick, right. stick with them, you know, and it, it is a journey just getting that confidence, but every good night reinforces that, that confidence. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you've described, you know, how you were struggling with sleep. <laughs> you had the, the double edged sort of difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. Um, did you find that that was kind of affecting your daytime routine? Did you kind of try and modify your life as we were talking about earlier or compensate for, for lost sleep during the day in any way? I think it just led to an incredible coffee habit. <laughs> right. um, so that that's basically it. You know, I, I would expect bad nights and then have bad nights. And um, like in the morning I would, drink yesterday's coffee while waiting for today's coffee to brew. Like mm. I just needed it. Um, but I never, you know, I just always had to go to work and still be a mom and just kind of keep going. Um, but what is notable now that I'm sleeping so well is life is just easier. You know, mm. like I, my thoughts are just, they're clearer. I just have better energy. I didn't realize I didn't have good energy, but my energy is so much better now and I'm not a slave to coffee. So I can wait for today's coffee to brew before <laughs> drinking yesterday's. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, I think that's the main way that that played out was just mm -hmm. pushing, you know, pushing through persevering, trying to keep a happy face on things, but inside just feeling really kind of, I mean, despondence too strong of a word, but pretty upset every morning. Yeah. Like, oh, here we go again. Yeah. I, th I think you mentioned a, really important point you know that because you had that job because you had your kids it kind of forced you to adapt to stick to a certain degree of routine yeah um, many people you know find it really overwhelmingly tempting to either call in sick or even quit their job when they have when they've been dealing with really severe chronic insomnia yeah. but typically that's not helpful because then you don't have that routine so right. you tend to do, you tend to spend way more time in bed. Um, you won't be getting out of bed at a consistent time. There's no real impetus or reason for you to be out of the house, you know, engaging in life and being active. So you end up just being a lot more sedentary. And, you know, when we're sedentary, that's when the mind kind of wanders and it can focus on all these distractions, you know, and obsess about sleep. So I think that's an important thing to emphasize the fact I think you recognized it yourself. The fact you had that job that you've got your kids probably helped minimize to some extent the effect that insomnia was having on your days. Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I was very surprised in your course to learn not to go to bed earlier after a bad night. That mm. just seemed backwards to me until I thought it through and then realized, oh, that makes so much sense. Because I definitely 
once I would get the kids squared away at the end of the night, I would go up to bed as soon as socially acceptable, mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, not 730, but okay, let's see if I can sneak in there at eight or 815 or 830. And uh, it was always a disaster, but I never really connected the dots as to why. So I'd kind of go to bed and be like, oh, good, I've got two extra hours, I can catch up from last night. And it would just lead to all that non-sleep time mm. in bed and then mounting anxiety that here comes another bad night. Yeah, it, it can seem really counterintuitive, can't it? To when oh. I, I want to go to bed now, why can't I go to bed now? Why do I have to wait a couple more hours? Maybe I'm not going to be sleepy in a couple more hours or something like that. Yeah. But ultimately, what, what we're doing is just using the body's own mechanisms in our favor you know we're building up that sleep drive to make sleep more likely to really help it especially if we have a high level of anxiety and worry about sleep you know the more sleepiness we can build it ends up overpowering to a certain extent that worry and anxiety because yeah. we're, we're always going to sleep if we're awake for long enough and right. our goal in the short term is to just build that sleepiness and give you that early win, you know, so you can recognize that sleepiness and get those first few nights under your belt where it starts to get a bit easier to fall asleep. And then that really can give you the confidence and the motivation to keep moving forward. Yeah. I thought you were really bossy the first time you gave me like a bedtime. <laughs> I was really not happy. Yeah. <laughs> you gave me many choices, but I'm like, these are all terrible. And, mm -hmm. but it really did work. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it, it can be difficult to hear those suggested uh, initial sleep routines. Um, but I like to say, you know, they can look a little bit off putting when you first see them, especially if you've been used to spending so much time in bed. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes a good way of thinking about it is why not just try it, you know, just do an experiment for, let's say, two weeks. Um, if after two weeks you've not noticed any improvement, then come back to me and I'm, I'll quite happily have that egg on my face. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, but let's do that two week experiment first just to try it out. Um, because invariably, even within just a couple of weeks, you'll notice some kind of change, even yeah. if it's just a little bit more sleepiness when you go to bed at night. Um, and that can just give you that motivation to keep going forward. Yeah, definitely. So before you started on the course, was was what kind of things had you done or tried um, uh, in a yeah. bit to improve your sleep? I just think this is a good question because people with insomnia typically have this huge long list. Yeah. So I'm expecting people to recognize some of the things you're going right. to Right. I did a lot of different things. So uh, there was a time I had a recipe that was, two Benadryl, two Aleve, and two beers. I did that mm. for a while with plus and minus success. Um, I tried a fair number of sleeping pills from my doctor who was very good and said, you know, these are not a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I just need a pill, like knock me out. Um, I, um, I tried just regular counseling thinking that maybe if I just work on the problems that are rattling around in my head at night, maybe then I can get some peace. Um, I tried exercise, I tried some whiskey, um, and I, I think the thing where I finally discovered your course was, so my husband's also a physician and he said, you know, you're the worst one I've ever heard of. And, and I said, well, what would you do, you know, if I was your patient? And, and he said, he'd refer me to this particular specialty place in town. So I Googled them to see what they had which was CPAP and I knew I didn't need that, but the, what they offer for insomnia is this machine that you wrap around your forehead and it cools your head temperature down and you wear it all night long mm. and it costs $700. And I said, that is crazy. Like mm. if, I, but I, I felt so desperate that I was like, well, maybe I should wear a machine around my head all night. Mm -hmm. um, but it just seemed wrong. And then when I found your course and was like, it actually what I need is a skill, you know, like mm. I don't want to be traveling with this machine my whole life and, you know, tied down to this thing. So it just finally made sense. I really need to learn a skill. Um, yeah. And I think the very first email you sent me was, you know, these pills don't help. Right. <laughs> and, oh, and I had tried vitamins and herbs and lavender and, you know, Anything anyone would ever suggest to me, I would go to the vitamin store and buy. Um, mm. And I'm like, all right, this is actually, I'm losing a fair bit of money on all this garbage, you know, mm. at the end of the day. So, um, 
so yeah, when you suggested weaning off, I just stopped that day because I, I knew it really doesn't help at all. So yeah, you know, th that's the thing with th there's only one thing that generates sleep, and that's just our own biological sleep drive. Um, and we can have pills, supplements, hardware, technology, sometimes they might help distract us and just lower that initial barrier that's in the way of sleep, typically mm -hmm. like this high level of worry or anxiety. Um, and that might then help us sleep. But even then, the sleep is only being generated by our own body. Like mm -hmm. nothing else can generate sleep. There are yeah. things out there that can generate sedation that can make us I, unconscious, right? But that's I'm not the really, same as sleep. Yeah, I've been thinking about Michael Jackson and his issue, and I was like, yeah, if I could have an anesthesiologist in my home mm -hmm. to knock me out every night, that would right. be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but not a good solution. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if, if any of these truly worked, then that insomnia wouldn't exist. Yeah. You know, because the, the, the solution would be out there. Um, it would be this medical device or this magic pill or something like that. And no one would ever have insomnia. So that's further evidence that these things just don't work. And like you say, it's sleep is this ability that we never lose. It's with us forever. Um, we can get in the way of it and make sleep more difficult. But ultimately, if we're awake for long enough, we'll always sleep. And we kind of harness that knowledge in and give you the skills, you know, and help you change the certain behaviors and the certain thought processes that are getting in the way of sleep and making it more difficult. Um, and, you know, these cognitive and behavioral techniques. And that's why they're so effective that you touched upon because they're skills. They're, then they're with you for life. You know, mm -hmm. you can recognize the beliefs that you had that weren't helping, the behaviors that you were implementing that weren't helping. You can address all them. Your sleep starts to improve. And then those skills are with you for life. So if ever you struggle again in the future, you don't have to take out this new subscription, buy something else. You've already got these skills. You just re-implement what you know from experience works. And that's just why they're, they're such a great solution. And they ultimately are a really effective long-term solution. You know, these cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia techniques. Yes. Thank you. You know, and I think uh, some people might be a little bit curious listening to this, that why are there two doctors here <laughs> that have been, that were kind of a bit confused about insomnia and struggling to uh, know what the best solution is for insomnia. Yeah. Um, why, why, do you, why do you think that is? I know, you know, I've, I'm friends with a sleep physician and he told me that during his MD training, he got maybe 10 minutes uh, education. Oh, none. Yeah. None, I would say. Yeah. yeah. And it is funny because being a pediatrician, I talk to parents all day long about good sleep habits for their kids, you know, mm. and I really kind of from four months onward have, you know, pretty explicit advice like, hey, you need to get on this project because you need to teach your child some independence. So uh, mm -hmm. it is totally ironic that I can share information all day long about this and yet kind of come home at the end of the day and I'm just a person <laughs> struggling. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't say when I went to medical school, which was back in the 90s, that there was really any, any information at all about that, either that I um, remember. I did fall asleep a fair bit in lectures, I'll confess. <laughs> Um, but yeah, not a big part. And I, I think the whole sleep medicine kind of arena has really blossomed, but mm. I feel like the emphasis right now for that is really on machines again, you know, CPAP and, you know, giving people a quick fix rather than helping them. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think when it comes to sleep, I think the emphasis is typically to more towards sleep apnea. Um, and in terms of the overall messaging that's out there it's all really focused on the importance of sleep and good sleep hygiene mm -hmm. you know and the issue with that is the only people really reading those messages about the importance of sleep are people who are struggling with sleep right. and this is really unhelpful messaging because it puts more pressure on you to try and get more sleep yeah um, and it makes you worry about the potential consequences of poor sleep um, and even to this day, you know, we don't have one study that finds insomnia causes any health problems. We have studies that find associations, but we don't have anything. We have no concrete evidence that chronic insomnia causes any health problem. But as soon as a new study comes out with these association, up go all the headlines, some creative writing in the media, you know, and everyone just thinks 
if I don't fix this, I'm going to have Alzheimer's, I'm going to get cancer, mm-hmm. or I'm going to have Parkinson's, you know, and that just heightens the worry. And then you read about sleep hygiene, which we know doesn't work for people with chronic insomnia because it's more of a preventative set of techniques right. than a natural intervention. And people will try that. It doesn't work. And that leads to more worry because then you think, well, everyone's telling me to do sleep hygiene. I'm, I've done it. It didn't work. I must be this really unusual case. I'm doomed. Yeah. I'm destined for, I don't know, very bad things. There's no hope for me. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's a real shame that that yeah. is the current, the current situation. I, I think that's why I got really for a while fixated on just finding the right sleeping pill because I thought I'm so abnormal. Mm. I just need a chemical to shut my brain off, you yeah. know? Um, and yeah. And then, and then that just led to more of a, a wild goose chase a while yeah yeah i think yeah i think it, it's the problem i the problem i see with sleeping pills is that they can just give you this mistaken belief that they're generating sleep or that you need them to sleep um which i guess is fine as a temporary measure for a couple of days um but it, they're, they're not a long-term solution because really you need to regain that belief and that confidence in your own ability mm-hmm. to sleep in order to sleep well for the long term and as long as you have like this external crutch, this thing that you feel you need to have in your life to generate sleep for you, I think there's always going to be a struggle. You're always going to have that higher than normal level of worry and arousal about sleep. Yeah. You're never really getting to the root problem. Um, whereas changing the way you think about sleep and changing these unhelpful behaviors, that really is key. Um, yeah. Because then you're just removing all the obstacles and all the barriers to sleep and giving it the best chance possible. Yeah. So you, you enrolled in my online coaching course um, about four months ago, almost to the day now. Um, and this, my coaching course just focuses exclusively on evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques. So in other words, we look to change the way you think about sleep, address like all these inaccurate beliefs that many people have about sleep, um, and just help you implement behaviors that give you the best chance possible of sleep and address again these dysfunctional or inappropriate sleep related behaviors such as spending too much time in bed Mm -hmm. so when you were going through the course you i think you touched upon this earlier talking about the uh, sleep scheduling but what what kind of techniques did you find especially hard or challenging to implement like what were you were there any techniques that, that you were really struggling with so Initially, the later bedtime was challenging more mentally than physically. It was just so objectionable. <laughs> and, um, and especially because my husband was going to bed at what I considered to be a normal time. And mm. I'm like stuck alone downstairs. What am I supposed to do by myself? Um, but actually, I, that paid off pretty quickly. So I could see that that was good. You know, mm. so once I kind of got through that, I never... Uh, grew fond of the 30 30 rule Mm. at all that that was just a big stickler for me um so I feel really happy that I don't I don't need it very often Mm -hmm. um but and I don't know if it's just you know here in New York it's cold at night you know so Mm -hmm. like getting out of bed at two in the morning and wandering around like oh and I just never really had a great itinerary for like well what am I going to do for that time period while I'm waiting to fall asleep other than watch TV or something like mm. that. So, um, I, that rule, I never, I understand it, you know, mm. like I get it, but it, to actually implement it has not been good for me. Yeah. That one's tough. Yeah. yeah so just for people that are unfamiliar with these techniques, so the, the sleep scheduling is just to do with allotting an appropriate amount of time for sleep. So typically what we do is we look at what an average nightly sleep duration is over the course of one or two weeks. And we'll add around half an hour to that just to account for time it takes to fall asleep, some time awake during the night. And then you have this overall duration. So let's say your average nightly sleep duration is five hours. We'll add, say, half an hour to that. And we'll say, okay, moving forward, try allotting no more than five and a half hours for sleep. So figure out what your final out of bedtime will be let's say 5.30, just to make the math easy, Mm -hmm. count back five and a half hours, and then you have an earliest bedtime of midnight. 
So what this does is because we're still allotting more time for sleep than you actually spend asleep, we're not looking to reduce the actual amount of sleep you get, but we're just looking to reduce the amount of time you spend awake during the night, you know, because that really feeds into this sleep related worry and anxiety. Um, and we're also trying to give you that consistent morning out of bedtime, which is helpful to make sure we've got enough time to build sleep drive during the day and to give your body clock that really strong morning anchor so that it's going to be sending, allowing these sleepiness signals to be taking over at night rather than you get out of bed really late and your body clock could still be sending these wake signals at the time when you want to be going to bed. Mm -hmm. And then the 30-30 rule, you know, this half hour, half hour rule is to do with stimulus control. So what we want to do is many people have just learned that the bed is an unpleasant place to be you know, because they've struggled night after night. So just thinking about bed or getting into bed just immediately activates the arousal system, you know, almost like this fight or flight mode and your mind just becomes really active. You get worried, anxious, um, and that makes sleep difficult. And it's understandable because you've experienced so many difficult nights in bed. Yeah. You've associated the bed with difficulty and wakefulness and frustration. Um, and ultimately, the way we address that is by making sure the only thing you do in bed is sleep or you're relaxed and sleepy enough for sleep when you're in bed. And so the only way we can do that ultimately is by saying, if you're awake, you're frustrated, you're anxious, you're alert, you know, all those negative emotions when you're in bed, that's your cue to just get out of bed. And it really doesn't matter what you do. When you get out of bed that much, you know, if you like watching TV, that's fine. Reading a book, that's fine. It's just, we say just to get out of bed, just so you're not reinforcing the idea that the bed is a place for wakefulness, for frustration, for worry and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are in bed, you know, during your sleep window and you're feeling calm and relaxed, there's no need to jump out of bed because the conditions are right for sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just when it starts to become unpleasant that's when it's often a good idea to get out of bed. So you're not reinforcing that association. Um, and in addition, getting out of bed is often a bit more appealing than staying in bed when you're really struggling. Yeah. And just the process of getting out of bed and doing something else can distract the mind. So it doesn't just obsess about sleep and worry and frustration. I mean, it often helps you feel a bit calmer a lot more quickly compared to just staying in bed in the dark alone with your thoughts. Right. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So I just wanted to cover that because not everyone that's listening may be um, familiar with, with all the techniques. So was there any particular moment, you know, you mentioned that when you first saw this, this new sleep window, you kind of a little bit um, reluctant to try it, but you did try it. Yeah. Um, but was there any particular moment when you realized that these techniques you were implementing were working and that your sleep was starting to respond positively? I really feel like a, a, a couple of weeks in, maybe three weeks in or maybe four, I actually was looking forward to going to bed. Like that wow. the negative cycle definitely broke, mm -hmm. um, which was incredible for me because mm -hmm. yeah, I had so much dread around bedtime, laying down, you know, is my husband going to fall asleep before me? And then I'm just left alone laying there, mm -hmm. you know, rattling around in my brain. Um, and so, and then success just brought more success, you know? Mm -hmm. So the more I looked forward to going to bed that made the next night's bedtime better. And then, oh my gosh, two good nights in a row, you know, could I do it a third night? And um, so it, yeah, it just kind of, I think one thing just built on the other. Yeah. It was very helpful. Um, and then I can't remember what week this is, but where you introduced the, um, um, the exercises we should do during the day kind of to calm our thoughts. Mm. Um, so now when I, I still wake up at night um, mm -hmm. and I just kind of acknowledge that as, oh, I've completed a sleep cycle. I'm just in between sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of in my mind run through, I feel peaceful. I feel content just a couple times. And almost all the time I just go right back down into sleep and it mm -hmm. doesn't evolve into a, you know, a big, a big deal in the middle of the night. So yeah. 
I, I think you had said the word confidence. I think that's the biggest improvement I have is I just feel confident. Like I can pretty much handle it. Not a hundred percent, you know, I've yeah. had, I've had some setbacks, but, um, but they don't rattle me like, Oh, here we go. You know, here goes five more bad years. You know, yeah. I feel like, okay, one bad night. Okay. I know what I need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that was really helpful when those exercises got added. And I think that helped me not need to do the 30, 30 rule because mm-hmm. I had something I could do when I was awake in the middle of the night, just to keep my brain occupied in a more positive thing rather mm-hmm. than getting anxious again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that was great. You know, that you start, that you said that you start to look forward to going to bed yeah. you know, because I think many people listening to this who have struggled that they think, no, that's like the, that's the part of my day. That's the part of my life. Even that I dread is going to bed just because I know that it's going to be really difficult. And just I know. Like well, changing that mindset, right? Yeah. Just to it's funny even to spend this time talking with you about it now. I'm like, oh, can't wait till bedtime tonight. Like, yeah. and that's really that's new for me. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and you know, you, you described this as well. You know, where you get those few early wins, so you start to feel a little bit more confident, and you worry a little bit less about sleep. So then your sleep typically responds and makes sleep becomes a little bit more easier. And then you worry a little bit less, sleep becomes easier. So it really turns that vicious cycle of more worry, making sleep more difficult, leading to more worry completely on its head. And it turns this vicious cycle into a positive cycle. Um, and it, it really just kind of becomes self-reinforcing. You know, there's the more good nights, the more wins you recognize, the less you worry. And then the, the more your sleep responds and becomes, yeah. becomes better ultimately. So was how what was my next question going to be let me just look through here so how did your sleep improve as a result of all the techniques you learned about and you implemented um you mentioned earlier on that you know your difficulty really was falling asleep and staying asleep yeah. um what are, what are things like now how, how how would you describe a typical night now i can pretty much fall asleep within 10 minutes of deciding to turn the lights out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I often have a, a long standing problem I have is if I do fall asleep and get awoken by something within the first 15 or 20 minutes, whether it's my husband or a kid or a phone call, I get this just full like fight or flight. Like just, I'm super jazzed up if I get that early awakening. And in the past I would just be like, forget it. This whole night mm-hmm. is shot. And now, even when that happens, because it still does, I can say, okay, I can just start fresh from the top Mm -hmm. and maybe I'll go back and read a little bit, or maybe I'll do one of those exercises, but I can, I can pretty much put myself to sleep pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, I have my, what I used to think of as like the Holy grail of sleep would just be eight continuous hours. Mm -hmm. Um, And now I see that that's, you know, I've had that a few times, um, Mm -hmm. but more, I just recognize I will pop up a couple of times in the night, but it is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I can just put myself right back to sleep. Like I did at bedtime, kind of within typically within five minutes, I would guess Mm -hmm. for the middle of the night pop-ups. Um, and then I wake up in the morning, just feeling really happy about what, what just happened rather Mm -hmm. than super upset about how the night went. Yeah. So dramatic change for me you know i i wrote some notes here from you know when we first started working together and then when you eight weeks later when you finished the course and i think it was when when you first enrolled you were saying that it would take you you know up to an hour to fall asleep um at the start of the night and by the end of that eight weeks we were looking at sleep onset for around about 10 minutes yeah um what a really funny thing that you put in your initial questionnaire, you know, that I get people to fill out upon enrollment was yeah. how, how many times do you wake up during the night roughly? And you put a million. Yeah. <laughs> I stand by that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then in your sleep diaries, you know, by the end it was, I think an average of like one time once, once per night. Yeah. Um, and I think with those nighttime awakenings, it's important to recognize that, they're normal, you know, it's yeah. a, a normal part of sleep is waking during the night. Um, and the difference when you have chronic insomnia is you're just far more alert to them. So mm-hmm. as soon as you wake up, you know, you immediately worry that you've woken up. 
Um, and that in itself just makes it more difficult to fall back to sleep. Whereas someone that pays no attention to their sleep, you know, they wake up, they fall right back to sleep again, and then they probably don't even remember waking. Right. Um, so we can get this really distorted belief when we have chronic insomnia that there's a problem there because we're waking. But really, the waking itself isn't the problem. It's that activation of the arousal system yeah. once we wake that is yeah. the problem, you know, and that's what we look to address with these CBTI techniques. Um, yeah. And then I think your time awake during the night to, you know, lead on from that, I think when you filled out that sleep history questionnaire, you were saying it was over an hour and a half, you know, it was just time spent awake during yeah. the night tossing and turning. And I think at the end of the eight weeks, we were looking at around about 15 minutes during the night. Um, yeah. And then your average nightly sleep duration, um, when you enrolled, you said it was about five hours. At the end of the eight weeks, you were looking at um, over six and a half hours. Um, yeah. In terms of sleep duration now, do you think that has progressed anymore? You still think you're probably around about six and a half hours? Probably better because I consistently get up at 6.30 in the morning. Um, I tend to... I make myself stay away from the bedroom till about 10 PM. Mm -hmm. um, that I've gotten much more strict about. Like I honestly, I used to try to sneak up there early, you know, 8 9, 9 30. But now I'm like, I don't want to enter that bedroom till 10 and I might read for 15 minutes or so. So possibly lights out by 10 30. So it's possible I'm getting much closer to eight hours, um, which feels incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's something that I do typically see as well, you know, because like you mentioned earlier, we, you're ultimately just learning new skills. You know, yeah. that's what these cognitive and behavioral techniques ultimately are. It's just the new skill set. And so as long as you just stay consistent with them, um, even when you stop working with, with me or with whoever you're working with, your sleep will typically continue to improve until right. you get to that point when you found your own individual sleep requirement. Yeah. You know? So yeah, that's not all that surprising that after eight weeks we stopped working together, you were around six and a half hours, but now you're probably maybe seven and a half hours um, closer to your individual sleep requirement. Um, so that's not surprising. And I think that's should be further encouragement, you know, that yeah. you can do this on your own as well. You don't need someone by your side all the time. Um, once you've learned these skills, it's just a case of consistent implementation and practice. Yeah. So um, one thing that I did want to talk to you about was, you know, setbacks, relapses oh, yeah. when you go through bad patches. Um, so we stopped working together after eight weeks and we've already touched upon how since then you're, you're actually sleeping even better than at the end of the eight weeks. But in between that time, were there any setbacks along the way? Um, yes. I, so um, struggles? yeah, my father died um, maybe two weeks after the course ended and it, it almost seemed like everything went away. I, mm -hmm. I was back to um, just total alertness at night and mm -hmm. I'm so upset. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, you know, you, the last session you gave during the course was on setbacks. So it was, it was so helpful to just acknowledge like, Hey, this isn't just, one person going through this, this is a known thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did, it's such a blur now, but I, I did, I just got, went right back to being alert at night and, um, you know, my brain thinking too hard about things. And I remember I emailed you and you just said something calm and reassuring. And, you know, I went back to kind of doing some of the, um, mindfulness exercises during the day to remind my brain what to do at night when I woke back up and um, kind of just went back to the skills you taught me. And so it, it sorted itself out within a couple of weeks and, mm. and then has improved. Um, but yeah, that, that was really devastating. Like, oh my gosh, all this hard work and, you know, yeah. and there we go. But also just to acknowledge this would be normal for anybody to have a sleep yeah. discussion with something so big like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the recognition that it would be, it would be abnormal for you to sleep well during a time like that, you know, so it's to be expected that you're going to experience sleep disruption. Um, and I think the, the key is to just recognize that and also to just 
go back to implementing what you know from experiences worked for you in the past. It can just be so easy to experience a setback and then think, oh, that's evidence that these techniques don't work, that I'm somehow different, that these techniques aren't going to work for me, that I'm beyond yeah. help. Um, but, you know, if you are able to take a step back and think about the progress you've made, what was the reason why you made that progress? It was because of these techniques you implemented. So therefore, by by the by by reason of logic, if you implement them again, then you should expect your sleep to get back on track. Um, and I I almost see it as like this test. You know, it's like your insomnia testing you. It's like, are they ready to true? Is this person really ready yeah. to truly let go of me yet? Let me yeah. see if I can get back into their lives. Actually, so full confession, I called my doctor. I'm like, well, my dad died, so I need sleeping pills now. Mm. Um, and she gave me the prescription and I took one and it didn't help. And I'm like, I'm not doing this. These don't help. And so, um, yeah, it, it was like this little inner battle come back. To, yeah. Yeah. So I, a, a, a more lighthearted setback that I'm not struggling with, but kind of coping with right now. Cause I know I'll be okay. But on, um, Wednesday nights I play in a band now for oh, it's, nice. it's, it's a two month thing and it's so fun. It's, so it's once a year, every January through March. And so in the rehearsal is from seven to nine. So mm -hmm. at nine o'clock, I'm pretty jazzed up, you know? And, and so historically when I try to go to sleep after band practice, I'm just like, da, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. And so I've just been much more deliberate. You know, I come home and I just need an hour to yeah. unwind. Like I just can't expect to pop into bed and, and fall right back asleep. So mm -hmm. I just really trying to be deliberate about, you know, unwinding, maybe a glass of wine, read a boring book, watch mm -hmm. a very boring TV show and, yeah. and not, um, not just going right from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway yeah that's 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 really encouraging you know and it, it's this example that i like to use is as parents we know that we don't put our kids to bed when they've just finished running laps around the house mm -hmm. right because they're yeah. too hyperactive their mind's active their body's active they're not going to go to sleep we know that you know give them a bath read some books have some unwind time but that knowledge you know we just don't really apply it to ourselves as adults right. you know yeah. we somehow expect to just come home from work or stressed out, get into bed and expect that our body's just going to send us straight to sleep or we come home from an enjoyable activity even, but we're still hyped up and we'll then go straight to bed and then be frustrated that we didn't fall asleep. Not right. recognizing, you know, that the parenting strategies we're using our kids are just as applicable to ourselves when it comes to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, I've taken a lot of your time and I really appreciate um, every, the time that you've given up. I think there's a lot of information here that people are going to find helpful and reassuring. Um, I do like to always end with this one question. And I, so I'm going to pose it to you too. Okay. Um, if someone with chronic insomnia is listening and feels as though they've tried everything, that they're beyond help, they can't do anything to improve their sleep, what would you tell them? I, I would beg them to try this um, because I think I was the worst sleeper ever. Mm. Um, I, I mean, maybe someone's worse than I was, but I really think I had just terrible, terrible sleep. And um, these methods really worked um, and saw me through some bad times and kind of got me right back on my feet. And, and now my quality of life is just so much better. And there's nothing harmful about these methods. Mm -hmm. So um, unlike taking sleeping pills or, you know, alcohol or other things that we, we can try, um, there's really no downside to these methods. So I would just um, really, really encourage somebody to give this a try. That's great. Thank you so much for your, for your time, Gretchen. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for listening to the Insomnia Coach podcast. If you're ready to implement evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques to improve your sleep, but think you might need some additional support and guidance, I would love to help. There are two ways we can work together. First, you can get my online coaching course. 
This is the most popular option. My course combines sleep education with individualized coaching and is guaranteed to improve your sleep. You will learn new ways of thinking about sleep and implement better sleep habits over a period of eight weeks. This gives you time to build sleep confidence and notice results without feeling overwhelmed. You can get the course and start right now at insomniacoach.com forward slash online. I also offer a phone coaching package where we start with a one hour call. This can be voice only or video, your choice, and we come up with an initial two week plan that will have you implementing cognitive and behavioral techniques that will lead to long term improvements in your sleep. You get unlimited email based support and guidance for two weeks after the call, along with a half hour follow up call at the end of the two weeks. You can book the phone coaching package at insomniacoach.com forward slash phone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Insomnia Coach podcast. I'm Martin Reed, and as always, I'd like to leave you with this important reminder. You can sleep. <laughs>